Ephesians chapter 6, beginning with verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, Taking you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, take the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Praying always, with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints, and for me, that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in bonds, that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Two weeks ago, we looked at this strange scripture. I got to the first word, finally. And I never got past that word finally. I hope to get a little bit further today. But when Paul said finally, he said, everything I've told you, I'm summarizing up now. I've already told you what it means to be a child of God. I've already told you about the awesome, tremendous power that God has available to every believer. And I've told you how you can have that power, how it's available to every believer. Therefore, based on what I've told you, I want to tell you something else. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. I've told you about His power, and if you're going to be strong, it'll only be through His power. If you're going to be strong, it won't be through your own strength. The adversary is far stronger than we are. And if we're going to face Him in our own power and our own strength, we are doomed to failure. If you're going to be strong, let it not be in your strength, but let it be in a strength that you don't have, but you can receive from the power of God. Let it be from a power that God has available to you that will fill your heart and fill your life. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might because that's the only way you'll be able to stand. Stand, therefore. Be strong in the Lord and put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil for we wrestle not against flesh and blood. You see, folks, we're in a war. So many people won't even recognize war when it's on our doorstep. But we are in a war. We're in a war and it's not a war of flesh and blood. We're in a war with the spirits of the air and the spirits and the forces of darkness. We're in war with the devil. Let me tell you, when any person makes a stand for Christ, he is declaring war and the devil is declaring war upon him. And if the devil's not giving you any problem, it's because you're not giving him any problem. The devil recognizes the enemy and he is on the attack. He is known as the destroyer. He came before God and said, I am going for, to and fro upon the earth, seeking whom I may devour. Let me tell you, the adversary is out to devour everything that's good, everything that's wholesome. He's out to devour Christian homes. And there's a war against Christian homes today. There's a war against marriage today. There's a war against the God's greatest gift of man and woman that joins us together. We are under attack. There's a war against churches today. There is a war against Christians today. Folks, we are in a war and we need to be prepared for it. And that's what the book of Ephesians is all about. Stand because you need all the armor and all the power and all the strength that God has available for you if you're going to be able to stand. We're in a war and we're wrestling not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against spiritual weakness in high places, against the rulers of the darkness of this world. We are in a spiritual war and the devil is out to destroy. He's out to destroy everything you are and everything you has. He is out to destroy you. And it's time that we recognize that and we stand against him. Wherefore, because we're at war, you need to go into war prepared. You need to go into war with your armor, with your protection on. Wherefore, taking you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, having done all to stand. We have been given not only the power of God to fill our life, but we've been given the armor. And Paul is saying, put on the armor of God. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. We need to be clothed in Jesus Christ. 
I remember I've told you before about that little chorus I remember singing as a very young teenage boy. Oh, the best thing in my life I ever did do was take off the old robe and put on the new. The old robe was dirty, all tattered and torn, but the new robe was spotless and it had never been worn. Oh, the best thing in my life I ever did do was take off the old robe and put on the new. You need to be clothed in Jesus Christ. He needs to totally envelop your life. If you're going to stand in this war in which we all face, then you need to do it knowing that you stand not alone. You stand not under your own power, not on your own strength, not under your own ability, but you are enclosed in the very glory of God because Jesus says, I want to enclose your life in my truth. I am truth, and I want to make you a person of the truth. A child of God needs to be one of truth in every area of his life. Stand therefore, having on the whole armor of God, with your loins girt about with truth, having on the breastplate of righteousness. You see, the breastplate, that's what covers your chest. That's what covers your heart. Have your heart covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. Stand before God with a righteousness that you didn't earn, that you didn't achieve. Not something that you did for you, but something that God has done for you. Because you see, the only way we can ever be made righteous is not by doing the best that we can do. Not by trying to the most of our ability, but by recognizing all that we can do leaves us far short of the glory of God. And come in and accept from Him as a gift what we can never earn, what we can never achieve, but what we can only receive. And that is the gift of God, His righteousness. Let it cover our heart. Let it cover our life. Stand in this life, not based on who you are or what you can do, but on who Jesus is, what He did on Calvary's cross, and what He wants to do over and over through your life, through your witness, through your love, very expressions, because we've been called to be the very heir of God. We've been called to be the living self-expression of a glorious God. Our life is called to be a living gospel. Stand before God with His righteousness so filling your heart until it just overflows. Like that little old chorus, it's bubbling, it's bubbling. Remember that little chorus from junior years? It's bubbling in my soul. The Jesus Christ power and righteousness simply needs to bubble over out of our life. Stand having on the breastplate of righteousness that covers your life and covers your heart. For you see, that righteousness is one that we received as a gift of God. Not one that we earn. Our righteousness is not based on what we have done or what we have not done. What we can do is based on the fact that Jesus died for our sin. That Jesus died to cover everything that we've ever done. And that we now have been washed and made made clean. I love that old song. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. We stand before God with only one claim, and that's that the blood of Jesus was shed for us. And we accepted that blood, and we had it applied to our life, and therefore we stand not by trusting in who we are, what we can do, but trusting in who Jesus is, what He did on Calvary's cross, and what He did that day when we invited Him to come into our heart and life. Stand therefore clothed in the righteousness that only Jesus can give. When we stand before God and based on His righteousness, we can stand with a calm assurance. Let the devil rage. You see, if my salvation was depending on me and what I can do, I'd be in shaky hands. But it's depending in Jesus and therefore it is secure. Stand, therefore, having on the breastplate of righteousness and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. I like to call that glory shoes. We need to have on our glory shoes. Our feet prepared and shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. First of all, we need to have our own life prepared by that gospel of peace when we accept Jesus and give our heart and life to Him. We need to have our own life prepared, but we need to be prepared to share that gospel. We need to be prepared to take that gospel. We need to be prepared for our whole life to be a demonstration of the glory of God. That's what the book of Ephesians is all about. We are called to be living examples of the glorious grace of God, what He did in our life, and what He can do in the life of anyone who will come accepting Him as Lord and Savior. Have your feet shod with glory shoes, the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, take the shield of faith, wherewith you'll be able to quench most of the fiery darts of the wicked. Did you miss that? Stand with the shield of faith. God has given us a shield. Let me tell you, the evil one is going to be throwing all kinds of fiery darts. He's going to find the weakest point of your life, and he's going to try to attack it. God says, I've given you a shield. And it's a shield of faith. 
And you take that shield of faith and therewith you can quench not some, not most, but all the fiery darts of the wicked. Let me tell you, the devil is shooting fiery darts at us today. He's shooting fiery darts at you. He's shooting fiery darts at your home. He's shooting fiery darts at your church. The devil is in the business of shooting fiery darts of trying to find a weak spot. A weak spot in our life. A weak spot in our home. A weak spot in our business. A weak spot in everything about us. And he wants to attack that weak spot. But God says, I've given you a shield of faith. When the devil fires that fiery dart, you've got that shield of faith and it'll hold it up and it will block those fiery darts. Let me tell you, the devil will attack us and sometimes he'll attack us in such a way that it seems our faith is totally shattered, that it's stretched to the very nth degree. Don't ever pray for more faith. If you pray for more faith, you're praying for tribulation. You're praying for distress because faith comes through tribulation. If you pray for faith, you're saying, God, put me to the test. God, put me through things that will shatter my life. You see, that's how our faith grows. When we're overwhelmed with circumstances and situations where it seems our faith is stretched to the very breaking point, and in that stretching, our faith grows. Let me tell you, it's a dangerous thing to pray for more faith because the only way you'll get more faith is to go through trial and heartache and heartbreak and tribulation. But through it all, through it all, I found that Jesus is sufficient. Through it all, I found that Jesus can come and meet us at the point of our need. Above all, take the shield of faith wherewith you'll be able to quench all the fiery hearts of the wicked. You see, stand firm in the faith that Jesus paid it all. Stand firm in the faith that Jesus is the answer for the need of your life. And Jesus will give you the strength to see you through. Stand firm in the assurance that Jesus said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. I'll be with you all the way. Come what may. Doesn't matter how you're under attack. Doesn't matter the fiery darts that's thrown there. I'm with you and I will lead you to victory. I love that old song. There's victory in Jesus. Let me tell you, I've discovered there's a truth to that song. For there is victory in Jesus. And without Jesus, there's nothing but failure. Stand therefore, knowing that you have victory in Jesus Christ with that shield of faith. Take the helmet of salvation. All oh, the helmet. You know, that's what's on our head. That's sort of our crowning glory. Take the helmet of salvation. That helmet of salvation is what God gave to us as a free gift that day when we stopped trusting in who we are and what we can do and we start trusting in who Jesus is. What He did on the cross and what He did that day we invited Him into our heart. Take the helmet of salvation. You know, when one's out on the battlefield, he doesn't stop and reach up and see if his helmet's still on. He doesn't take time out to think about his helmet he's in the battle. But you know, the fiery darts of the wicked are always coming at us and making us wonder if we still got that helmet of salvation on. I became a child of God when I was eight years old, almost nine. I accepted Jesus. Preached the first sermon when I was 12. Started preaching regularly when I was 14. You know, when I was preaching as a teenage preacher boy, there are times I began to doubt. I began to say, well, you know, did you really know what you were doing when you were eight years old? There were times when the devil threw that fiery dart at me of doubt. I'm not going to ask how many here have ever doubted whether you're a child of God. Probably I need to ask, is there anybody here who hasn't doubted? Because that's one of the fiery darts of the devil. He wants to throw at you and make you wonder whether you're a child of God. Because if you're up there reaching, see if you still got that helmet on, you're not in the battle. You've lost focus. So one of the favorite tactics of the devil is to come to every Christian and throw a fiery dart and make you doubt whether you ever were really saved. One day as a teenage preacher boy, I suddenly realized one thing. The plan of salvation is so simple. Jesus said, whosoever cometh unto me, I will in no wise cast out. Jesus said, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any person will hear my voice and open the door, I will come in. Not I might come in. Not I'll think about it. But as emphatically as Jesus can speak, He says, if you'll open the door to your heart, I will come in. So much I'll eat with you. I'll live with you and you with me. Whosoever comes into the Lord, He'll in no wise cast out. So as a teenage boy one day, I just simply said, well, Lord Jesus, if I never really accepted you, I accept you now. Jesus, if I never gave you my heart, I give it to you now. Jesus, right now, I want you to be my Lord and my God. And every time I was tempted to doubt, I said that little prayer. 
Well, Jesus, if I never accept you, I accept you, John. You know what? From the time I was 16 years old, all of a sudden, the devil saw he had a losing battle. And I've never been tempted to doubt again. So if you're tempted to doubt whether you've ever been saved, whether you're a child of God, hey, let's get rid of it! Simply say, sincerely, Lord Jesus, if I never accepted you, I accept you now. Lord Jesus, I open my heart, I invite you to come in, be my Lord and my God, then what does the devil have to stand on? Take the helmet of salvation. Be assured of your salvation. And if you're not sure today, let's get that settled once and for all. This day, don't leave here wondering whether you're a child of God. Simply say, Lord Jesus, if I never really accepted you, I want to get it settled. Right now, I accept you. I invite you into my heart and into my life. Right now, I want you to be my Lord and my God. Right now, I want you to forgive me of my sin. You know what? That worked for me. And I think it'll work for you. I'm telling you something that as a teenage boy, I went through the wilds of the devil. I went through the fiery darts till one day I remembered Jesus said, all I ask you to do is open the door to your heart and let me come in. And so if there's any question about it, just open the door to your heart and say, Lord Jesus, if I never really ask you in, I do it right now. Right now. I want you to be my Lord and my God. I want you to be my Savior. You know what? That worked for me. And I believe it will work for you. Because the devil has no more doubt that he can throw when you're doing what God says to do. Take the helmet of salvation. And the sword of the Spirit. Hey, everything up to this point has been defense. Now guess what, folks? We're going on the offense. And we've got a weapon. Take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. This is our weapon, folks. We need to know our weapon. We need to be familiar with our weapon. We need to learn our weapon. If you're in battle, and we are in battle, if you're in war, we're in war. We need to know the weapon that we've got to attack. God's Word is powerful. Sharper than any two-edged sword. This is our weapon. You become familiar. Live in that Word. Live in that weapon. And use that weapon. When the devil tries to attack, God will bring to mind that weapon that you've been preparing for and studying and know, and he will give you the word from his word. Use that weapon. Verse 18, praying always. You see, in this life, when we get low of energy, when we run down, God has a spiritual filling station. And we can just pull up to that super gas pump of prayer when you get run down when you don't think you can go any further let me tell you God's got a spiritual filling station and it's called prayer praying always oh the devil has a substitute for prayer and it's called worry yeah here I am back on that again you see I've said many times if you're going to worry don't pray worry is the devil's imitation of prayer Worry will not help you one bit. Worry never accomplished anything good. Never, worry never made you feel better. Worry will tear you apart. Worry is the devil's counterfeit to prayer. The devil is going to give you worry. He's going to try to make you worry. And let me tell you, if you're going to worry, don't pray. Because worry is praying to the devil. Worry is saying, devil, I want you to control my life. Worry is nothing at all but a cheap counterfeit for prayer. Prayer gives peace. Prayer gives power. Worry tears us apart. Worry gives nothing good. So if you're going to worry, don't bother to pray. You can't pray to the devil and you can't pray to God. But I'm going to tell you folks, if you're going to pray, don't worry. If you're going to pray, you don't have to worry because they are opposites. They are directory contradictory. You can't both worry and pray. You're contradicting yourself. Why worry when God says pray? Come before God. Praying always. Prayer and supplications to all the spirits. Come saying, Lord, I need your strength. 
I need your power. I need you every hour again. Remember the truth, truth of that little children's song, I am weak, but he is strong. That's why we need to constantly pray. That's why we need to live in an attitude of prayer. We are weak. We cannot oppose the adversary ourselves. We'll fail and we'll fail miserably. But Jesus is able. And while I can do nothing in myself, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And with Jesus living in my heart and Jesus in control, we don't have to worry because we can pray. We don't have to worry with the devil's chief invitation because we've got the real thing. And that's the power of God. And it's made available to us. Paul says, there's your source of refreshment. There's your source of power. It's not called the hour of power for nothing. Prayer is the secret weapon God has given to Christians that gives us the power. Pray with prayer and supplication in the Spirit. Watching there with all perseverance and supplication. You see, prayer is what gives us the strength to keep on keeping on, to persevere. Paul says when he talks about prayer, he says, hey, well, pray for me. You know, if I'd been writing that, I said, pray for me. Paul writes this in prison, knowing that his execution is not far off in the future. And if I'd been writing this, I'd have said, y'all pray for me that I'll get out of jail. Paul said, pray for me, but he didn't say pray that I'll get out of jail. He didn't say pray that the outcome of my trial is going to be better than it looks like. Paul says, you pray for me. But here's what he said. You pray that even while I'm in prison, I'll have an opportunity to share Jesus. You pray for me that while I'm here in jail awaiting execution, I'll have the opportunity to speak about Jesus. Listen to what he said. Pray for me that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am ambassador in bonds, that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Paul says, you pray I'll keep on doing the very thing that's put here. You pray that I'll have an opportunity to tell somebody about Jesus. You pray that I'll have the opportunity to be what I've been called to be. For you see, I've been called to be His heir. I've been called to be His living spokesman. I've been called to be His living gospel. I've been called to be His living testimony. I've been called to be a living demonstration of the glory of God. And you pray as long as there's life in my body, I'll be what I've been called to be. Doesn't matter. Let the devil rage. Let him attack my body. Let him cut off my head. But you pray as long as there's breath in my body. I'll be what I've been called to be and I'll do what I've been called to do. Oh boy. Paul says you pray. Don't pray that you all get out of jail. Don't pray that I'll avoid execution. But you pray that I'll be what I've been called to be. As long as there's breath in my body. Shortly after that, it's a very strong tradition that tells us Paul signed the book of Ephesians in his own blood. When that executioner came with that axe. And he was on the chopping block. You know, I can imagine in my spiritual mind when Paul on that day when he was set for his execution was led up and they placed his head down on the chopping block and that executioner with that black rag over his face raises that big axe. I can imagine Paul looking up and saying, wait a minute, wait a minute. Everybody holds their breath. Is Paul going to recant? Is he going to denounce Christ? Is he going to beg for mercy? Then I can hear Paul say, wait a minute. Did I ever tell you what happened to me on that Damascus road? In my dying breath, I've been called to be his witness. Let me be what I've been called to be. Doesn't matter what happens to me. I have a glorious call and help me to be that which I've been called to be. That is what the book of Ephesians is all about. Folks, that's what being a Christian is all about. Let us be what we've been called to be. The heir of God, the living self-expression. One through whom Jesus is living and loving and revealing himself. One whose very life is a demonstration of the glory of God. That is the book of Ephesians. As we come to its conclusion after many months, the message is, you have a glorious, tremendous call with a glorious, tremendous power that you can have so that you can actually be what God has called you to be.